Hello, my name's Christopher Anatra. You know me as the Quantum Businessman. Welcome to another episode I've titled Positive Timeline Insertions and Other Chess Moves in the Earth Game. In a previous episode, I brought into your awareness the concept of a negative timeline insertion. I dealt primarily with World War II changes and how Nazi Germany was positioning itself to win the war in our timeline with attacks in New York Harbor and over 5,000 people killed by U-boat off the New England coast. One of the things that I had mentioned was that Hitler now has blue eyes. This is quite shocking for many people who remember him as having brown eyes. And then, just a day or so before I premiered part two of Negative Timeline Insertions, while it was being edited, I had found that Charlie Chaplin now has blue eyes. I had previously done some careful research about Charlie Chaplin, and everything that I found said that he had brown eyes. I was curious about this because of his connection to Hitler. Hitler and Chaplin were born days apart and had a similar body type and look. Some have said they were versions of the same being, one of the light and one of the dark. Hitler's eyes are now blue from brown, as many people remember, and all information online clearly stated that Charlie Chaplin had brown eyes. However, shortly before this video was released, I checked again, and now Charlie Chaplin has always had bright blue eyes. The same sites that claimed simply that his eyes were brown now state that they are blue and that many had thought his eyes were brown because of his black and white films. They never said anything like that just 48 hours before. If you remember from my Gilligan's Island Mandela Effect videos, the fact that most of the cast now has green eyes was an oracle indicator that something had changed. With Gilligan and the castaways, it meant that they had more charisma and could have greater influence on our dream or our holographic reality. So what could Hitler and Chaplin's brown eyes turning to blue mean? First off, remember that what I tell you next has nothing to do with one eye color being better or worse than another. Rather, you can think of the eye color change as an oracle indicator that something is now different from a past timeline. So here is what their eye color changes track back to when accessing the knowledge of Earth. Or in other words, the Wi-Fi of our body connects to Earth's field via biophotons to access memories stored in light. In the future, most people will be able to do this, so this information I am presenting will be verified. Hitler, now having blue eyes in this ascended timeline means that the total number of civilians and soldiers killed as a result of the Nazis is now half as many as when he had brown eyes. Sit with that for a moment. Half as many people were killed than when Hitler had brown eyes. Chaplin, now having blue eyes in this ascended timeline, means that the number of people that would commit suicide is now half of what it was when Chaplin had brown eyes as a result of his comedies. Chaplin's films would make people laugh hysterically. Remember that laughter is the biggest chess move to prevent suicide. This also means that he fulfilled one of his soul contracts about reducing the number of suicide deaths. So congratulations to Chaplin. Now, let's get back to Hitler and his blue eyes being an indicator that half the people were killed now than in timelines where he had brown eyes. One thing that I did find is related to soldiers and civilians killed by Nazis in the Soviet Union 
is that it now stands around 24 to 26 million. I have a memory of that number being much larger, closer to 50 million. I also remember at least a million killed during the siege of Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg, during World War II, mostly from starvation. The reason I have a memory of the 50 million killed in the Soviet Union is because my brother had visited this area about five years ago and took a photograph of a statue of a soldier leaving to defend Leningrad, despite his mother trying to hold him back. This soldier happens to look very much like myself when I was younger. It really shocked my brother and his wife. As soon as my brother saw the statue, he sent me an email and some photos right away. This motivated me to learn more about the siege of Leningrad and also the Soviets' involvement in World War II. And now I'm shocked to learn that the Nazis allowed 1.7 million people to evacuate the city before the siege, mostly women and children. That information had never appeared before. Regarding Chaplin, one thing I can mention, which might shed some light, has to do with the October 1929 stock market crash. Do you remember how many stockbrokers and investors jumped out of the windows of their Wall Street and high-rise buildings when the stock market crashed? About that, Will Rogers famously said, when Wall Street took that tailspin, you had to stand in line to get a window to drop out of. And this was something that I was taught since being a kid, that there were hundreds that committed suicide on that famous day in October of 1929. Guess how many stockbrokers and investors jumped out of their windows now or committed suicide in any way when the market crashed in 1929? Zero. What? Zero suicides. That is shocking to me. Not so shocking when you now realize that Chaplin's film, The Circus, which was released in 1928, was one of his funniest films ever. In 1929, he won Best Actor and Best Director for The Circus. Laughter, it will save lives every time. Today with this episode, I want to focus on positive timeline insertions. I wanna start by talking about Philip K. Dick, the author of The Man in the High Castle, Blade Runner, Total Recall, etc. These books inspired major motion pictures and television series of which you are probably aware of. In 1977, Philip K. Dick held a press conference in Metz, France. What he revealed to the crowd, despite their smirks of disbelief, was actually what we today call the Mandela Effect and how timeline insertions are made. Only shortly before making this video, I watched it for the first time. I had heard of his speech, but never took the time to listen to it. I was blown away when I did. In speaking about what we would consider a personal Mandela effect, he said, We might reflexively reach for a light switch in the bathroom, only to discover that it was, always had been, in another place entirely. We might reach for the air vent in our car where there was no air vent. A reflex left over from a previous present, still active at a subcortical level. We might dream of people and places we had never seen as vividly as if we had seen them and actually known them. But we would not know what to make of this, assuming we took time to ponder it at all. Has that ever happened to you? It certainly has happened to myself. For example, where I live on the coast of Connecticut, for 25 years I would drive and ride my bike down a road where there was a body of water that was connected to the Long Island Sound. I knew the area and that road very, very well. I could almost drive it blindfolded. One day, in 2017, I drove by a location and noticed a small island near the road that had never been there. I thought perhaps the tide had gone out and it was exposing that island that I had never seen. But I noticed the tide was high 
and the trees on the island were very old. At that time, I was just starting to learn about timelines and how geography is even different from one timeline to another. If I didn't understand how our consciousness can shift timelines, I would not have understood what was going on. I may not have even pondered it much at all, though it would have caused a bit of mental distress. How could I have missed that obvious little island for 25 years? Then. In 2019, on the same road, a large sundial appeared on the side of someone's house that I had never seen. I stopped my car and asked my older son to inquire about how long that sundial had been on the side of the house as the owner was outside doing some yard work. He said he had no idea, but it's been there a long time. So, as Philip K. Dick said, reaching for an air vent in your car that was no longer there, or reaching for a light switch in the bathroom that has now always been in another location. We can see in this part of his talk, he was referring to what we call today personal Mandela effects. Different from the big Mandela effects like Stouffer's stovetop stuffing never existing, but even more jarring on many levels. I'll provide a link to Philip K. Dick's entire speech, and I have the manuscript. Note that because of the French translator and for the sake of time, he does skip over parts of the manuscript during the press conference. I want to read to you part of his manuscript for this speech. The man in the high castle is not fiction, or rather is fiction only now, thank God. But there was an alternate world, a previous present in which that particular time track actualized. Actualized? and then was abolished due to intervention at some prior date. I am sure, as you hear me say this, you do not really believe me, or even believe that I believe it myself, but nevertheless, it is true. I retain memories of that other world. Guess what, Philip? You're not the only one who retains memories of that world. Before we get to the positive timeline insertions, I wanna talk about chess and how Philip K. Dick used it as a metaphor to describe what was happening. I have the impression that the metaphor of the chessboard is especially useful in evaluating how this can be done. In fact, must be. Chess is a board game of strategic skill for two players played on a checkered board. Each player begins the game with 16 pieces that are moved and used to capture opposing pieces according to precise rules. The object is to put the opponent's king under a direct attack from which escape is impossible. This is known as checkmate. Think about this. One player on the dark making negative timeline insertions and another player on the light making positive timeline insertions, using strategy to win the game. The game of chess is the metaphor that Philip K. Dick used which in my opinion explains timeline insertions, but it is a very simple metaphor as to what is actually going on. You could think of thousands of players or millions of players on different levels, all using strategy such as timeline insertions so they can win their game or achieve their outcome. Checkmate. Ah! Here is the rest of what Philip K. Dick said, and as you listen, please suspend any judgment about how he refers to God as a programmer. If you think about it, a programmer is a creator, sometimes a creator of advanced technology and systems. So I think we all at least agree that God is a creator and of infinite wisdom, yes? Besides that, listen to what he says. Across from the programmer reprogrammer sits a counter entity whom Joseph Campbell calls the dark counterplayer. God, the programmer, reprogrammer, is not making his moves of improvement against inert matter. He is dealing with a cunning opponent. Let us say that on the game board, our universe in space-time, 
The dark counterplayer makes a move. He sets up a reality situation of immutable cause and effect. But the programmer, reprogrammer, has already laid down his response. It has already happened, these moves on his part. The printout, which we undergo as historic events, passes through stages of a dialectical interaction, thesis and antithesis, as the forces of the two players mingle. His metaphor of chess really nails it when you understand that there are both positive and negative timeline insertions or chess moves at play, each with their own strategies. As I said, a simple game of chess between two players though is a very simple comparison to the size and scope of what's going on. You could think of thousands of players or millions of players on different levels, all using strategy such as timeline insertions so they can win their game or achieve their outcome. And sometimes bad chess moves are made. For example, the dark player makes a move and a timeline insertion is added where the Nazi party has a big rally at Madison Square Garden in 1939. The goal is to enlist support for the Nazis from within the United States without the need to declare war or drop an atom bomb on New York City or Washington DC. But this negative chess move doesn't quite work out the way as planned. In 1939, Germany sent thousands of Nazis to New York City. And with 20,000 Nazis inside Madison Square Garden, Isidore Greenbaum, a 26-year-old Jewish plumber from Brooklyn, gets inside and sits through three hours of Nazi propaganda against the Jews. He is a Jew surrounded by 20,000 Nazis. Finally, he's able to make his way to the stage and he pulls the microphone cables away from the speaker. Now, I do have to say, if Isidore Greenbaum was an Italian plumber, I bet his name would have been Mario. That would have been super. Regardless, for what he did, he really is a hero. The Nazi SS quickly grab him, brutally kick him. They rip his pants off, they break his nose, they give him a black eye, all to the delight of the Nazi crowd. New York City police officers had to pull him away to free him from the attacking Nazis. But in that one moment of time, we saw firsthand the Nazi brutality right in New York City. It really shocked people to the core. People thought, wow, those Nazis are bullies. They shouldn't be trusted. Not a good chess move. And I wonder why the name Isidore Greenbaum isn't known and why there were never any major motion pictures made about this event, or a video game called Super Isidore Brothers. Though the Nazi rally itself was an obvious negative timeline insertion, it's obvious that our hero, Isidore, was a positive timeline insertion to counter the Nazi rally. One man making a statement against 20,000. If you were in that situation, would you have shown the courage of Isidore? A small move, but brilliant. Do you begin to see how a master chess player makes his moves? And guess what? You can believe those Nazis got back on their ship and hightailed it right back to Germany after that rally. Interestingly, Isidore Greenbaum went on to enlist in the US Navy and fight the Nazis. Then, in 1940, the positive player makes his move and inserts the great dictator film by Charlie Chaplin, which changed the psychology of the war, the power of the mind, the power of laughter. Chaplin made people laugh at Hitler and the Nazi party. He took away that element of fear, that element of fear that is used to control people. He took away despair, such as Hitler had been creating in Europe. Chaplin made Hitler look like a tyrant, made him look ridiculous and laughable. Chaplin also reduced the number of suicides. So let's talk more about positive timeline insertions. Here is my next example, Watergate. What, Watergate? That's positive? How can that be? I thought Watergate marked a very dark time in American history. What is Watergate? 
Watergate in one minute? Are you kidding me? Watergate is a scandal in American history that resulted in the downfall and eventual resignation of Richard Milhouse Nixon. Richard Nixon ran for his second term in 1972 and he did not want to lose. He lost in 1960 to JFK. He won in a squeaker in 1968. So 1972 was going to be different. And he had a bunch of people that worked for him and their nicknames, aptly enough, were the Creeps, the committee to re-elect the president. And basically what occurred is whether Nixon knew in the beginning or not, I don't know, but it was a plan to infiltrate the Democratic offices at the Watergate Hotel to basically steal their stuff, to find the nitty gritty, to find the dirt, and to win the election. Unfortunately, the burglars were caught. And even though Nixon trounced in 1972 and won that re-election, it was after that election through the trials of these burglars where it became known that they were working for the White House. The Watergate scandal is really about a cover-up rather than the actual burglary and whether or not Nixon was using his powers in the office of the presidency to basically hide this scandal. When it came known that Nixon had recorded many things in the White House, there was a subpoena issued for these tapes. Nixon refused to give those tapes over, claiming executive privilege. This became the trial, Nixon versus United States, where unanimous court forced him to give those tapes over. And this is the magic words right here. Nobody, Mr. President, is above the law and the Constitution. When Nixon had to give those tapes over, he knew the gig was up, so he quit, he got out of town. So there you go, guys. Now you know a little bit about Watergate. So now that you know what Watergate was, let's hear what Philip K. Dick said about it. Setting into motion a thread of change which culminated in what I am sure you will admit was a spectacularly important and unique historical event. The forced removal from office of a president of the United States, Richard Nixon, as well as all those associated with him. In the alternative world which I remembered, the civil rights movements, the anti-war movements of the 60s had failed. And evidently, in the mid-70s, Nixon was not removed from power. That which deposed him, if anything indeed existed that, it did, that did oppose him or could oppose him, was inadequate. Therefore, one or more factors tending toward the, that destruction of the entrenched tyrannical power had retroactively to us come to be introduced. What a police tyranny is like, and how vital it is now or then, at any time, along any time track, in any world, to defeat it. In March of 1974, the really crucial moves to depose Nixon were beginning. In August, five months later, they proved successful. Specifically, on August 9, 1974, Nixon resigned and therefore ended any chance of the police state timeline manifesting. The Watergate scandal saved the day and our nation. Any society in which people meddle in other people's business is not a good society, and a state in which the government, quote, knows more about you than you know about yourself, as it is expressed in my novel, Flow My Tears, the policeman said, is a state which must be overthrown. So, the chess player, representing God the Creator, or the positive player, did a positive timeline insertion of Watergate, which led to the resignation of Nixon, which led to the police state never forming in the 1970s. Note what else Philip K. Dick said about this in relationship to Christians. I am saying not merely it can happen here, meaning the United States, but rather it did happen here, meaning the United States. I remember, I was one of the secret Christians who fought it and at least to some extent helped overthrow it. When, you, when I use the word Christian there, I do not mean Christians as they are now. I mean Christians as they were, say, 2,000 years ago, enemies of a powerful empire. When I saw Star Wars this morning, I thought to myself, deja vu. Philip K. Dick said that on another timeline, Christians were freedom fighters. They were like the rebels from Star Wars. They were nothing like how Christians are known today. How does that make you feel? 
Could you imagine that being the case in other timelines? But whether it was Christians fighting the police state or any other group that dares to stand up against tyranny, on this planet or any other planet, whatever the cost, this is called the eternal struggle. The eternal struggle between light and dark. Now, let's move on to another positive timeline insertion. Abraham Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation. We know that the Emancipation Proclamation abolished slavery in the United States. It ensured that humans in the United States could no longer be born into slavery or sold into slavery and that all men were created equal. Abraham Lincoln may be our most loved president of all time. Despite the Civil War, he overall created a lot of positive influence going forward for the United States. But is it accurate to say he was a positive timeline insertion? My answer is yes, because on many timelines, he never even made it to become president of the United States. And on many that he did become president, the North lost the war. I wanted to let you know that I'm bringing up Lincoln for another reason. We've been talking about eye color previously, and I wanted to ask you what you remember Abraham Lincoln's eye color to be. Now, I know back in the 1860s, color photography was not a thing, but there were still many portraits painted of him, and I clearly remember his eye color to be brown. However, Abraham Lincoln's eye color is now officially gray. Is that a Mandela effect for you? What does his gray eye color mean? Does it mean that the Civil War killed less people or that more slaves were freed? When reading into it, it actually means something I bet you'd never be able to guess. Now get ready for this one. Are you sitting down and buckled up? Abraham Lincoln's eye color of gray was related to giants. It was related to the DNA of different giant races that he held and had authority. It meant that the giant DNA codes that he held were united in expression. His gray eye color represents the most possible unity he could provide to the North and South. This is because in ancient times, giants were here in North America and they ruled our land. Wait, what? Abraham Lincoln and giants? Has the quantum businessman gone a bit too far off course? At first I was like, giants, really? Honest Abe had giant DNA? I know that Lincoln was tall at six feet, four inches, but what is this about giants in North America 10,000 years ago? Then I did a little research and quickly found this. To date, we probably have about 14 or 1500 accounts in going from Catalina Island, California to Martha's Vineyard. Double rows of teeth, seven foot and taller skeletons reported. New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, and it's not just newspaper accounts. George Washington reported giant bones in Virginia. Even Abraham Lincoln talked about the discovery of giant bones. At a certain point, I reluctantly started to believe. Lincoln even gave a famous speech at Niagara Falls in 1848, where he spoke about giants. By the way, I always remember it as Niagara Falls. However, in this timeline, it's always been Niagara Falls. He spoke about giants. Lincoln said, the eyes of that species of extinct giants whose bones fill the mounds of America have gazed on Niagara as ours do now. Now, I never remember hearing about this. So for myself, this is a Mandela effect. He goes on to talk about the mammoth and the mastodon. He refers to the mounds of America that were filled with giant bones. One such mound is located in Illinois, his home state, named Cahokia Mounds, which I'm sure he was aware of. And if he had ever visited that area, it would have activated his DNA. My point in mentioning this is that when you gain access to information such as the meaning of an eye color change, you never know what path that's going to take you down. Interestingly, the actor Daniel Day-Lewis 
the star of famous films like Last of the Mohicans, Gangs of New York, and Lincoln, about Abraham Lincoln, has an eye color change. Many, including myself, remember him as having brown eyes. But now, his eyes have always been gray, like Lincoln's. Daniel Day-Lewis had gone to extreme efforts in going into character to create the most authentic version of Abraham Lincoln. Could these efforts have had the effect of shifting him to a timeline where his eyes were gray, just like Lincoln's? It certainly is something to think about. Other positive timeline insertions include Martin Luther King Jr. As in many timelines, he was not able to finish his work and get his message out. Tank Man, or the Unknown Rebel, is the nickname of an unidentified Chinese man who stood in front of a column of tanks leaving Tiananmen Square on June 5, 1989, the morning after the Chinese military had suppressed the Tiananmen Square protests by force. As the lead tank maneuvers to pass by the man, he repeatedly shifted his position in order to obstruct the tank's attempted path around him. This incident was filmed and smuggled out to a worldwide audience, showing that one man can make a difference. By the way, in the timeline that I remember watching this, Tank Man was actually killed by the tank. However, in this timeline, he just maneuvers around it and even jumps on the tank. He talks to the tank driver. So this is a big Mandela effect for myself. Nelson Mandela not dying in prison. The situation that the Mandela effect was named after was a positive timeline insertion, which allowed Mandela to stay alive until 2013. Thai police in Thailand laying down their weapons and joining protesters despite their orders to harass and block the protesters. The protests were about the corruption and abuse of power of the Thai government. And you have to include Woodstock on this list of positive timeline events. Woodstock was a music festival held in August of 1969 in upstate New York. It attracted an audience of 400,000. In 1969, the country was deep into the controversial Vietnam War, a conflict that many young people vehemently opposed. It was the era of the civil rights movement, a period of great unrest and protest. Woodstock was an opportunity for people to escape into music and spread a message of unity and peace. In conclusion, I'm gonna say that Philip K. Dick himself was a positive timeline insertion. All the books that he wrote really affected people on a level that they themselves could not understand in their conscious awareness. I know I'm thankful for his work, especially Man in the High Castle. In fact, if he never wrote it, I'd be missing a lot of valuable content for my last few episodes. In conclusion, I wanna mention something very positive that Philip K. Dick said in his famous press conference in France. Note what he said about the ultimate timeline where the savior returns. I think I once experienced a track in which the savior returned but I experienced it just briefly. I am not there now. I'm not sure I ever was. Certainly I may never be again. I grieve for that loss, but loss it is. Somehow I moved laterally, but then fell back and then it was gone. A vanished mountain and a stream, the sound of bells and all gone now for me, entirely gone. Did you know that he spoke about having experienced a truly wonderful, positive, heaven-like timeline? May we all keep ascending and find that ultimate positive timeline. It's there, we just need to get to it. So there you go again. The quantum businessman is not just about business, but positive business. Do you think I was gonna stay all negative? And I've got so much more to talk about. Timeline, brand, takeovers, like what Kraft did to Stouffer Stovetop Stuffing, and of course, the time cops. Who do you think brings the law and order to timelines and the multiverse? Until next time. Hello, my name's Christopher Anatra. You know me as the Quantum Businessman. 
At the 2020 Mandela Effect Conference, you won't want to miss my talk about Timeline Paradoxes, the 1986 Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. The Mandela Effect community has raised questions regarding the fate of the seven astronauts on board the Space Shuttle Challenger. This is because there appears to be doppelgangers alive who resemble and even have the same names and birthdays as the deceased astronauts. Was the disaster a hoax by NASA, as many people have assumed? Or is there something else at play? Prepare to have your consciousness expanded with what actually happened when a timeline paradox was created. It may blow your mind.